You will hear a number of different recordings. You will have time to read the questions before each recording and time at the end of each recording to check your answers. The recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Now turn to section one. Section one, you will hear a conversation between a customer and a receptionist at a car rental agency. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now listen and answer questions one to five. Good morning. How can I help you? Hello. Is this Southern Rental Car? Yes, it is. I wonder if you could help me. I'm ringing from Nelson, but I'm coming over to Auckland for twelve days, and I'd like to hire a car. Okay, I'll fill in a booking for you now. First, can I take your name? Yes, it's William Waddell. Sorry, could you spell your surname? Uh, yes, it's W A D D E L L. Thanks. Now, can I have an address and phone number? Sure. I live at Ten Robin Place. That's R O B Y N Place. And that's Nelson, isn't it? That's right. Do you want my home number or my mobile? Home number will be fine. Okay. It's O seven two six three eight six six six. Great. Now, can I also have a credit card number? Do I have to pay by credit card? Well, we need a credit card number as a guarantee. It's a standard policy for car rentals. Okay. Well, I'll pay by Visa then. The card number is four five five zero one three nine two eight three zero nine three two two one. And the expiry date? Sorry. Your card. When does it expire? Oh, next July. Right. Now, how long did you want the car for? Twelve days, did you say? No, I only need a car for ten days, from the second to the eleventh of next month. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you will have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Now, what type of car are you looking to hire? Well, I'm not too worried about the model of the car, but I understand that you have rental cars from just twenty-five dollars a day. Is that correct? We do sometimes have the twenty-five dollar deals, but only in the low season. For the period you are looking at, the cheapest we have is thirty-five dollars. However, that price includes unlimited kilometres. Sorry, did you say unlimited kilometres? What does that mean exactly? That means that no matter how far you go, the cost is the same. Some companies charge for rental and then charge again for every kilometre you actually drive. Well, I am going to be travelling quite long distances. I'm visiting relatives, and they live quite far apart from each other. So unlimited kilometres are probably a good idea. If you're travelling long distances, you would be better off with an automatic. Changing gears in a manual can make it more expensive on petrol. Okay, I'll take the automatic then. Right. So that's an automatic car for ten days from the second to the eleventh. That's all booked. Is there anything else I can help you with? No, that's fine. Oh, sorry. What do I need to bring with me when I pick up the car? All you need is your driving license. Right. Well, thanks very much. Bye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. 
you will hear a speaker talking about property. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. I understand that you all own your own home and some of you may be interested in buying additional property here in the city, so I hope you will find the information I am going to share with you useful and informative. I'm going to talk about the situation with property here in the city. The city centre of any area is obviously going to have the highest prices, and as more and more people are competing for houses in this area, both renting and buying are becoming increasingly difficult. It is most people's dream to one day own their own house. House ownership gives us a feeling of having achieved something, and we can see clearly what we have worked so hard for all our lives. It can give us a sense of security for our old age and a knowledge that we will hopefully have something to pass on to our children. However, buying a house, particularly for first-time buyers, is becoming more and more difficult, not only due to increasing prices, but also because of the need for a substantial deposit. For younger people, buying their first home is very difficult and often impossible. Young couples who cannot get the deposit together need to rent for a long time and sometimes forever. While traditionally, homes near the centre of the city have been the most desirable, people are now looking further afield. This has happened for a number of reasons, the main one being that our style of work is changing, along with that of other countries such as the USA. In certain professions, for example sales and computing, it is no longer necessary for people to be based in an office full-time. More and more people are beginning to work from home, which means they can avoid the hustle and bustle of rush hour traffic jams into work and have more freedom to choose to live in a more rural and peaceful location. My company deals with finding property for both purchasers and renters in the city area. One of my main roles within the company is to find investment properties for people who wish to plan ahead for their future. You now have some time to read questions 16 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. An investment property is usually at the cheaper end of the market. People buy investment properties not to live in, but in addition to their own home in order to rent it out to other people. The advantage of putting your savings into property for the future is that you can be pretty certain that, as a long-term investment, your money will safely increase in value in line with inflation. Many people are turning to property investment instead of pension schemes, as we hear the horror stories of countries such as the UK, where people have invested all their lives into their pension schemes to find that now their money is relatively worthless. Houses automatically earn what is known as capital gains. That is, for every year you own the property, it becomes more valuable and often gives a better rate of interest on your money than most banks do. However, that is not to say there are no risks. There are people who buy property when the market is high and prices are inflated beyond their true value, only to find that when the housing market slows down, they are in a state of negative equity. Negative equity is a situation that arises when you owe more for the house than the house itself is worth. In short, the best advice is to be aware of the ups and downs of the housing market. Property investment, if handled correctly, can be enormously satisfying. I hope that this has given you an insight into the basics of the property market. Thank you for listening. Please raise your hand if you have any questions and I will try to be of assistance. That is the end of section 2. 
You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear a discussion between Steve and Melissa about their commerce course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hey, Melissa, how's it going? Great! I'm really pleased to have the exams behind me. Now I'm looking forward to a break for the summer, as I know next year is going to be unbelievably difficult, being our final year and all. You? Same. Pleased to be finished, but dreading next year, though. Well, I wouldn't exactly say I'm dreading it, but I know what you're saying. At least we're going to have smaller classes next semester. How do you mean? Didn't you hear? The Commerce Faculty just got approval to build a new state-of-the-art lecture building over the summer months. It's expected to be finished by the start of term. Fantastic! No more lecture theatres crammed with over 200 people. That'll make a pleasant change. How on earth are they paying for it, though? I thought the college was reining in its expenditure and decreasing spending. It is, but the grant has been approved for the best part of three years, so they have no choice but to provide it now that the project is going ahead. After all, those funds are supposed to have been set aside especially. So what's taken so long for the construction to start? You see, the grant only covers 30% of the cost. The incoming government made a pledge during the election campaign that it would cover the other 70%, but... Typical of a political party, wouldn't you know? It didn't keep its promise. The College Donors Club, a group of wealthy alumni, stepped in to pledge 10% of the money needed. But the project really only got a kickstart when an anonymous donor pledged the rest. Very mysterious. Yeah, and apparently he demanded that certain changes be made to the plans before handing over the money. Like what? Well, you know the proposal to have a gym in the basement? Don't tell me that's been cancelled. Not at all. In fact, our anonymous donor friend insisted on it being twice the original size and on a relaxation room being added as well. You know, with games and stuff. Sweet. Are we still getting our new computer lab? There's always such an awful queue for the existing one. We are indeed, and next to it there's now going to be what they're calling the Software Zone. A place where students can access all the latest high-end software free of charge. Nice. Thank you very much, Mr. Donor. Everything else is staying, right? Lecture rooms, hardware zone, etc.? Yeah, the rest the same. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. By the way, on the subject of college next year, Steve, have you decided what courses you're going to choose yet? Pretty much. I want to major in marketing, so I'm focusing on the international markets and product placement modules. Will you be joining me? Well, you know I prefer human resources. That'll probably be my major. But if you twist my arm, I'll probably join you for the first one. No way on all that product placement nonsense, though. Sounds boring. The organisational behaviour is a requirement if you want to major in HR, as is managing people, so I'll definitely do both of those. Will you join me on them, then? Sorry, Melissa. You know, HR is just not my thing. What about your optional modules? Do you feel like doing information systems with me? We all need to know a bit about the digital world, after all. Hmm, I'll get back to you. I haven't ruled out public relations, either. 
Let's chat about it again later in the week when I've had some time to think. Cool. I'll call you, OK? Sounds like a plan. I'd better go now. That's the end of section three. You have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. You will hear part of a science lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Now I'm sure most of you will be familiar with the concept of drones or unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs for short, to give them their technical name. If you are lucky enough, you may even own one. In fact, they are becoming so popular amongst gadget lovers that the sales of consumer drones were up by 24% in 2014. It is certainly a technology that is catching on fast and seems to have captured the public's imagination. People of all ages are seemingly fascinated by UAVs, whether the interest is professional or purely recreational. In fact, so far most members of the public tend to view UAVs as no more than a very sophisticated and expensive toy. As confirmation of this, Selfridges, the well-known London department store, has described them as the ultimate toy that spans the generations. However, in this lecture, I would like to talk about the more serious side to UAVs and how they may revolutionise the world of business as well as employment. With regard to the job sector, Analysts predict that the market for drones could be worth billions. In the US alone, drones could create up to 70,000 jobs in this booming new industry. This would definitely be a boost to employment in a time where so many industries are replacing their workers with machines. The consumer end of the market, though, is a mere drop in the ocean. The potential for drones to revolutionise the way we do business is where the real opportunity lies, and Britain has the potential to become the world leader. Probably the most novel and groundbreaking use for UAVs is as an e-commerce delivery service. However, the idea has yet to get off the ground, literally. <laughs> In principle, the idea is an excellent one. Consumers order items from an internet site and the order is dispatched and delivered to your door by an unmanned drone within minutes. The mail-order giant Amazon first conceived of drones as a delivery service in the US. But plans stalled, leading many to question if the whole proposition was merely a marketing stunt. More likely, though, the proposed drone delivery service conflicted with aviation rules as laid down by the US Federal Aviation Administration. The biggest problem in the US is that they've invested $5 billion in a new traffic control system. But it was years before drones were on the radar. Therefore, aviation laws are not compatible with or accommodate for UAVs. The UK, however, has much more relaxed aviation laws. Drones are permitted as long as they do not fly in crowded areas, as defined by the Civil Aviation Authority. 
It therefore makes the UK a very attractive country to develop the e-commerce delivery system in. Whilst the UK is trying to set up and run a drone-based delivery service, Britain is already a leader in the field of drone-based aerial photography. If you think about it, the potential for such photography is huge. Not only does it allow you to take photos that could only previously be taken from an aircraft or even hot air balloon, but drones can get much closer to their subject. This is obviously a great advantage if taking photos of dangerous wildlife on safari. For the moment, drone-based aerial photography is especially popular for weddings. It's a bit of one-upmanship for the bride and groom, really. I think most people are bored with the usual cliched settings of a church with a countryside backdrop. Well, so far, I've talked about all the positive aspects of UAVs. But we shouldn't forget that there have also been some problems experienced by those using this technology. Many of the problems have arisen because of a handful of hobbyists who are giving the industry a bad name. The issue mainly is with cheap drones flown by people without licenses. Because in the UK, unlike the US, a driver's license is officially required to fly a UAV. When someone flies a drone outside a controlled area like a park, you're heading for trouble. Only recently an accident caused by a drone made headlines. A photographer was injured in TGI Fridays when a stunt using a drone spectacularly backfired. That might be bad enough, but an even more serious incident occurred recently when a drone had a near miss with an Airbus A320 as it began its descent into Heathrow Airport. However, that said, with stricter regulations in place, Britain could soon see e-commerce delivery systems 24 hours a day and may become a leading centre for imagery shot by drones. It certainly is a burgeoning industry, where, if you pardon the pun, the sky's the limit. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.